And now confidence intervals. Confidence intervals are always a little easier than the hypothesis test. There are fewer steps, it's a little easier to do. One of the reasons why people, uh, statisticians, keep telling us to use them more often, because some, they would say a null hypothesis test has needless complications, at least some of them would say that, those who don't like a hypothesis test so much. So let's um, talk about confidence intervals here. A paired samples confidence interval is just like a single sample confidence interval. So let's review a couple of the things that we know about single sample and independent samples confidence intervals so far. A single sample t, looking at the difference between a null hypothesis test versus a confidence interval. In a single sample t, we have one sample in our, in our sample. We have one set of observations in our sample. We have one sample mean. The null hypothesis says that the mean is some specific value. In this case, I made it some value up there somewhere. So the null hypothesis says the mean is that, is that value, it's mu zero, some value. And we check to see whether our mean value is greater than or less than that by a lot or by a little. We get a p-value, we reject the null hypothesis, or we don't. A confidence interval is different. Everything is centered on your sample value. So the sampling distribution of means has a center that is the center of your sample right here. And you just, you just find the tails in the sampling distribution of means. You find the, the two values that cut off the tails or cut off the middle percent, 95% or 90 or 99%, and that's your confidence interval. This looks like it might be a 90% confidence interval from the size of those tails, maybe. And that's your confidence interval. It's, it's not a terribly complicated process once you can mentally keep track of what's going on. Actually, without keeping track of it, it's extremely easy to do the calculations. It's not difficult at all. As you've seen, you just follow a formula and you're done. So independent samples t complicates things because you have your sample, but then you have the null hypothesis saying that the sample values uh, came from two different populations, but those two populations happen to be equal to each other. So basically one population. And therefore you have a null hypothesis implied distribution of all possible differences between sample means that would have happened if the samples, if the populations are not different from each other at all. So if the populations have the same mean, then the samples on average should be the same too. On average, there will be any range of big and small samples, but on average they should be the same. So we get our actual sample difference and we put it in the distribution of all possible sample differences and then we have a t observed and a p-value. But a confidence interval does something different, just like with the single sample situation. The confidence interval says that there is a difference between the population means, and that difference is exactly, as it turns out, the same as the difference between our sample means. With a confidence interval, we're assuming that the average difference between scores in the population, or difference between means, I mean, in the population, will just happen to be the same as the difference between means in our sample. So the sampling distribution of differences is now centered over our sample value. Now this is not the same scale. This scale at the top is very different from these other two scales because this is differences. These are values on whatever scale it is. This is differences between those values. So the sampling distribution does that and then we just find the tails again of the sampling distribution. It's always just finding the tails of the sampling distribution. Paired samples t is nearly identical conceptually to the independent samples t, although the process will be similar to this to the single sample t. The null hypothesis says that both distributions uh, are the same that produced our sample, but the alternative hypothesis, there's our, our d-bar that we found compared to all possible d-bars, but the alternative hypothesis, or sorry, the confidence interval doesn't assume that. The confidence interval just says our best guess is that the population values are the same as our sample values. Therefore, the expected difference in the population is the same as the difference we see in our sample. And so we just find our two values that chop off the middle, say 95%, and that's our confidence interval. There you go. It's the confidence interval for the difference between two sample means, in this case, paired sample means. So the confidence interval for the difference is always the same format, as you see here. It's always a point estimate from your sample, plus or minus a Z or a T score times some standard error. So for a single mean when, when the population standard deviation is known, it's a sample mean plus or minus z, for whatever alpha you have, times the standard error of the mean, the standard error of the distribution of all possible sample means.
for a single mean when sigma is unknown, everything's the same except you have to use t to estimate what's going on in the population because you don't know the population standard deviation, and that's much more common. For a difference between two independent means, then your, your point estimate is a difference between two sample means, and your standard error is the standard error of the difference between means. In other words, the standard deviation of the distribution of all possible differences between sample means. And then for a difference between two paired sample means, it's kind of the same thing, but instead of saying x bar 1 minus x bar 2, which we could do, we conceptualize it as d bar because that's what we're going to do in our cal calculations. So our sample d bar time uh, plus or minus the t distribution that we need to find, or the t critical value, sorry, that we need to find, times the standard error of the differences, which in this case is the standard error of all possible d bars. D bar just sounds weird to say, you guys. I've said it before. So what's our best estimate of the value of the mean of all possible d-bars? It's zero. Well, sorry, the null hypothesis says it's zero. For a confidence interval, it's our sample d-bar. So as long as we use the right distribution, we'll get a good accurate confidence interval, a good precise confidence interval that will tell us good things about where the population mean might be given our sampling parameters, etc. So we've got to use that right distribution, which is the distribution of the difference, which is the sampling distribution of d bar, of, of d bar scores. And we need to use the right standard error, which just means we need to find the right formula for the standard error. And then we just find the lower limit and the upper limit for the middle whatever, whatever percent. All right, so let's run through an example here uh, taken from the previous lecture. Difference of two paired samples. We'll use this um, same data, made up data, from the past lecture about the treatment for social phobia and heart rate with 12 subjects. So pre-treatment heart rate versus post-treatment heart rate. Let's find a 99% confidence interval for the difference between pre- and post-treatment heart rate. So our sample is going to say there's a certain difference, but how confident are we about what the actual difference is? Where do, where do we think that is? So confidence interval is always a point estimate plus or minus some Z or T type score times a standard error, right? So no difference here, but we need to know what that Z or T score is. It's going to be a T score that cuts off 0 0.005 uh, proportion or five, one half of 1% in each tail of the T distribution. And we have to find the right T distribution. So the degrees of freedom is 11 because that's N minus one. There are 12 participants, 11 degrees of freedom. Our T critical turns out to be 3.11 here, 311, righteous. So we've got this formula set up, d bar plus or minus our t-score times our standard error. Start plugging things in. Our standard de deviation of the different scores is 20. d bar is 10.3. Sample size is 12. And the t-score we just found, the critical t to define the tails, is 3.11. So we calculate that out. We should end up with something like negative 8.5 and 29.1. We could put that on a little diagram here. So the mean of all d bars is 10.3. The lower limit is negative 8.5, and the upper limit is 29.1. So we're 95, or sorry, we're 99 percent confident that the true difference between pre and post test heart rates for all possible people who could have taken this therapy is between uh, an increase of 8.5 beats per minute and a decrease of 29.1 beats per minute. So in this case, a negative value would be an increase in heart rate. You've got to kind of keep straight what was what minus what, which direction you did things. So the interpretation on average, the heart rates were whatever, whatever. Confidence interval negative 8.5, 29.1 is zero included in this interval. That's a very important question. But what does that mean? What I mean is, what does that imply about if we would have done a null hypothesis test? The mean of that null hypothesis implied distribution would always be zero. So we ask, is zero included in our confidence interval? It is, right? Zero is between negative nine and positive 10. So it's in there somewhere. So what does that mean? Would we have rejected the null hypothesis if we had done a paired samples t-test with a two-tailed paired samples t-test with alpha equals 0.01? Would we have rejected it? Anyway, on to example two. Cognitive therapy example. We've seen this before. You can zip through this if you want, but it's in the previous lecture. So the cognitive therapy example here, uh, we've got our data going on. 
and here we go. Data coming up for us, mean and standard deviation, and then we calculated those D scores. That's what you've got to start out with. You've got to take your data, calculate some different scores, and ignore everything else. So we're going to find a 95% confidence interval for the difference between means, or the mean difference. So, just like we did before, point estimate plus or minus a Z-like score, or a T-score in this case, times a standard error. In this case, it, the only thing that changes in the formula right now is we've got the T for 0.025 in a different degrees of freedom distribution. But, same deal, plug in some stuff. Let's find that T-critical value. Turns out to be 2.26. It's a little nicer, uh, easier to meet T-critical because we chose a much more lenient um, alpha level, essentially. Instead of an alpha of 0.01, we've chosen alpha of 0.05. So the 95% confidence interval for the mean difference, plug things into this formula. 2.1 is our mean difference from the sample. 2.26 is the T. 2.56 is the standard deviation of the different scores, S sub D. And the N was 10, so it's minus 1. Here we go. Our confidence interval is 0.17 and 4.03. So our interpretation might be those who received cognitive therapy had social confidence scores after therapy 2.1 points higher than those who had received placebo therapy. So after participants, actually, I should reword this because all participants received both. You could say, after participants received cognitive therapy, they tended to have social confidence scores on average 2.1 points higher than after they had received placebo therapy. Standard deviation of those different scores. 95% confidence interval, there it is. Is zero included in this interval? And what does that imply? 